Honored guests, friends, colleagues. <laughs> I, I'm Morgan Day, and I'm the Director of Planning here at the World Food Prize. I'd like to say welcome to the 2017 World Food Prize Borlaug Dialogue International Symposium. If you'll please join me in welcoming our official party to the stage. A year ago, I took over this position from my mentor and colleague, Catherine Silvota, whom I'm sure many of you know and remember well. Um, I'm sure she'll be around this week, but I have enjoyed getting to know and meet with many of you over the past year, and I'm sure we'll get to know each other more over the course of the next three days. Our theme for this year's symposium, The Road Out of Poverty, is about the promise of agriculture to be an economic pathway to prosperity, not only for farmers, but for whole regions impacted by food insecurity. Ambassador Kenneth Quinn, the president of the World Food Prize, knows the power of agriculture and of roads uh, in uplifting people out of poverty. During his time as a Foreign Service officer in the United States State Department, he witnessed the way that new roads built in the Mekong Delta, when partnered with improved seeds, led to improved livelihoods and drove out the Khmer Rouge in conflict-ridden regions. Over the course of his distinguished career, Ambassador Quinn has served as the United States Ambassador to Cambodia, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, as a member of the National Security Council, and as a member of Iowa Governor Robert Ray's staff. Since 2000, he has taken on the mantle of working with and instead of Dr. Norman Borlaug as the president of the World Food Prize. If you'll please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you, Thank you Morgan. Um, and that's uh, for the very, very nice introduction. Uh, so I want to explain something as we begin about our program. We have a terrific lineup of speakers uh, for over the next today, tomorrow, Friday. Uh, and to the extent that you find it interesting, stimulating, engaging, it's all her doing. No, really, really. Uh, and um, that's the, there's, there's only one or two people who go home later than me every night, and Morgan is one of them. Uh, and that... So to the extent you find things that maybe there isn't something that you think is so engaging or so interesting, that's probably because I made her put that in and it's my fault. So Morgan, thank you. Thank You'll you. see her coming up from time to time. And that, but, so uh, we're, uh, you, you see our uh, slide, we have a focus on Africa and we have a focus on the road out of poverty as a theme. Uh, the man who's putting the signposts on there is our 2017 uh, laureate. Uh, and that, so uh, I want to put, uh, 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 tell you about the excitement that's building uh, for this and to show you the, ad, I'm sure you've all bought the Des Moines Register today, right? You know, when you're in town. But here's the ad that's in the paper today. And it's about one of the things the World Food Prize does, bringing the world to Iowa. And over the past uh, 18 years that I've been here, Bill Gates has been here, uh, Kofi Annan, Princess Haya, Xi Jinping, and now adding to that uh, illustrious group, our 2017 laureate. Uh, I want to uh, introduce and uh, ask you to join me in showing our appreciation for our chairman, John Ruan III. John, could you stand up? So. We could thank you. And now, and now to formally introduce on the stage our 2017 laureate, Dr. Akin Wumi Adeshina, the president of the African Development Bank. Akin, stay. So, so Akin, uh, the um, uh, we we have a number of surprises for you. Uh, we're, we're highlighted, and, and we have a special message from the president of Nigeria, His Excellency Muhammad Buhari, and uh, I loaded it myself this morning, so I hope it, uh, it's probably, if there's any problem, you'll see why 
but uh, let us show you that, uh, that message from uh, President Buhari. Received with delight the cheering news of your award as 2017 World Food Prize Laureate. Certainly, this did not come to me and many Nigerians as a surprise given your antecedents and contributions to the development of agriculture across the African continent. We are very proud of you. According to the World Food Prize Foundation, you won the prize for driving change in African agriculture for over 25 years and improving food security for millions across the continent. Your choice as the winner of the World Food Prize is a clear recognition and appreciation of your long-standing contributions reflected in your several roles and activities which promote social economic development. By dint of hard work, persistence, diligent efforts, and God's special grace, you have risen above many limitations to emerge as a notable figure and a true champion. Your life story mirrors the resilience of African spirit and doggedness for which Nigerians are well known. On behalf of the government and people of Nigeria, I congratulate you and rejoice with you, your family, and the AFDB family on this well-deserved honor. Congratulations. And, and and President Buhari has sent a personal representative to be here for the ceremony for you. And, and Grace Adashina, your wife, is here. Grace, could you stand up so we could welcome you? She, you, you, were, you were out this morning with my wife, Lay Sun, and, uh, for a, a, little, a tour around Iowa. So I hope you had a nice uh, experience. And uh, I'm sure you did a good job, dear, right? Yes. And, uh, and that. So uh, while this is a time of celebration, it's also a time when we remember those who are part of our family but no longer with us. During the year, uh, Dr. B.R. Barwali from India, the 1998 laureate, and uh, Dr. Evangelina Viegas, the first woman laureate, 2000, both passed away. We miss them, and uh, they'll be forever in our memory. Also, a few weeks ago, uh, Gus Schumacher, uh, passed away. Gus was supposed to be on the panel this afternoon on Russia uh, and Eurasia and agriculture. He had a heart attack, uh, a wonderful human being, and I just wanted to uh, share with all of you the sad news uh, about Gus. And he uh, certainly, somebody was at the very first World Food Prize event I ever did in New York in 2000 and there. So I felt a special kinship. Um, we have a wonderful council of advisors, uh, many of whom are here and in the audience. And uh, this year, we are adding three new members to the council. Uh, Tom Vilsack, a former Secretary of Agriculture, has joined. Dr. Ismail Sarageldin, who's here in the audience, and also Rachel Ruan McLean. So uh, our institution and the advice that I get is even stronger. Uh, and you know how important that is. We've had a great week. We started with the Iowa Hunger Summit on Monday. We had an amazing array. We had over a thousand people. Secretary Bill Northey was, was there and saw this over a thousand people sign up for the Iowa Hunger Summit, which is double the number that we've had before. Five secretaries of agriculture on a panel on this stage, three Republicans, two Democrats, all getting along and having, and having a wonderful con that's the power, the transformative power of agriculture and this. We also, you know, we have, uh, you're going to receive the World Food Prize. Uh, this morning they had the CAST Borlaug Communication Award Prize. Tonight we're going to have another prize. Uh, and on Monday we gave our 
Robert Ray Iowa Shares Humanitarian Award to Bishop Richard Pates uh, of Des Moines and they're able to, uh, to honor him. Tonight at the Hall of Laureates, you're all invited. Uh, we will have a ceremony when Dr. Zendling uh, Chui will receive the Borlaug Field Award endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Morgan will tell you uh, when the buses leave and so symposiums over, run downstairs, jump on the buses, come over to the Hall of Laureates for a, a wonderful event tonight. The doors open at 5.30, presentation begins at 6, and then you gotta be back here for 7 or 7.30 for the continuing side events that are going on. Uh, we also have the Global Youth Institute. Uh, tomorrow you'll be fighting for seats because there'll be 200 high school students in here uh, along with uh, 150 to 200 teachers, another 40 or 50 uh, Alums of our youth program are going to be here. This is an amazing program. And we have two more awards at our ceremony tomorrow night uh, when we give the World Food Prize to youth winners. We give two awards for youth winners. There may be more than two and that at, the, uh, uh, at the state capitol. Now, we have also a number of our World Food Prize laureates with us who are, who are here. Um, and, you know, I have to say, Dr. Adesina, you know, the, each laureate has his or her own idiosyncrasies, particular things they want, or uh, they, they may ask for something. They're very humble people, but, you know, it might be difficult to do. And so each, you know, they have their personality. But nobody has caused me more trouble from the laureates than you have. And, and, and the reason I say that is, you are so incredibly popular, as so many people have signed up. We're at like 1,040 registrations, somewhere around there. And every one, or it seems, has sent me an email telling me how it's absolutely imperative that they be at the Laureate Award Ceremony. Uh, and I've called, uh, Secretary, I called the governor. Is there any way we can expand the state capitol? Could we build on an addition? Uh, I'll pay for the construction. No, I didn't, Don, I didn't say that, I promise. Uh, uh, and that. But, but the problem is it'll only hold about 750 people. And what I do is, and, and this is, sort of, everyone who comes from outside the United States gets top priority. Because if you come here from another continent, uh, come here, uh, from another country, I think you should have priority about being invited to that ceremony. So that means not everybody, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're, you know, we're, we're nice in Iowa. We, we, that, that, that's how we got a good relationship with President Xi Jinping, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, and, but we, uh, we want to be uh, very nice and uh, welcoming to our guests uh, when you're here and let you have that experience. And that means that not everybody is going to be able to get a ticket uh, to come, and I apologize for that. But we will have a viewing party here in the hotel, and uh, it'll have food and drink, and it's a good deal. And it'll be down, I think, in Rock River, uh, I believe. I'm looking around for somebody to nod their head, uh, right? Uh, but Rock River here in the hotel, and if somehow you got left out, and everyone says, oh, I'm a friend of Dr. Adeshina. I've known him since third grade. Or we went, you know, we went to Purdue together. Uh, and that, but uh, so you'll be, come and be our guest there. You'll be able to see the ceremony on the television screens there. And it'll be wonderful. And I, thank, I, I ask and thank you for your understanding. We have a wonderful media partner in Farming First uh, who are here, who help us and promote everything about the World Food Prize. There's a new magazine being launched, uh, Agro Africa. Richard Mbarum has come all the way from Lagos, invited a hundred or so of his closest friends from all over Africa to be here to launch the magazine. And uh, the cover, uh, it features our laureate on it and uh, probably the magazine that reflects your vision of Agro Africa, if we were to sum up what uh, President Adeshina is focused on. So we're pleased to be the host for that. This wouldn't be possible except for our sponsors, 
and I want to show you uh, their name on here. So, and then there's another page, and then there's another page, and then there's another page, uh, and that of uh, generous contributions and support uh, that make all this possible. So uh, connect with us. I don't know how any of this stuff works. Uh, I, they, they, they have, uh, you know, a, a, a 20-year-old or 25-year-old walk around and they tweet as if they're me and they're connecting on uh, Facebook or whatever um, and that. And, um, and, and they say, people, you know, pay attention. I just don't know. Anyway, uh, anyway, we're, we're open, we're launched. I want to now uh, invite Mr. Ruan, Dr. Adeshina, to please leave the stage and come down to your seats and to uh, invite uh, our, our opening speaker, Martin Rieschenhagen, to uh, come to the stage. And So Martin Rieschenhagen is the chairman, president, and CEO of Agco Corporation. And I got to know uh, Agco uh, better in Berlin at uh, Green Week and the, uh, all of the activities going on there. And I came to see that their company has a very uh, direct focus in Africa. And so uh, I got in touch uh, with him and said, you have to come and, and speak at our symposium. And he explained to me that his schedule was such that it just, you know, just didn't see any other commitments and how he could be here. And he said, the, the only time maybe could make it work would be Wednesday afternoon. I said, done, you're on, uh, be here, because I think it's so critical. And it's interesting that having, my having made the connection in Berlin, because for many years, Mr. Rieschenhagen was the only German CEO of a US Fortune 500 company. He was born in Cologne, studied, and I love this, theology, philosophy, and worked as a French teacher <laughs> before he changed fields and started a successful international business career. So, wow. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, there, there's, there's still hope for a political scientist like me, uh, and that uh, he, uh, his uh, products uh, under the brands of Challenger, Fent, Massey Ferguson, one that we know well here, uh, Valtra and GSI are uh, well known through the industry, and he in fact is an agribusiness expert, often invited to come and speak at many different fora. So we are very fortunate to have him here with us today to deliver the opening address at the Borlaug Dialogue, Martin Rieschenhagen. Thank you, so this is how you get those kind words when you are the first speaker, when you are the 20th, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Um, I have to apologize, but I will speak to you in the most spoken language of the world, which is broken English today. <laughs> um, I'm headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, you might know that our biggest competitor is headquartered in Des Moines, so therefore it's very tough for me to come here. We, we, we have certain allergies, so when we, when we think about that. Um, and uh, you can hear from my accent also that I'm from Georgia, right? That's a typical <laughs> southern thing here. Um, I, want, uh, I was thinking about what to talk about, and I, I wanted to be well prepared. I, the only person I really knew was the laureate and uh, Ambassador Quinn, and when I then went through the list of participants, I figured out all important nations of the world are here. All important industries uh, or industrial participants of the food sector are here. Uh, all politicians or people 
who have been successful in uh, administrations are here, ambassadors are here, uh, and a lot of people from the academic world. And I said to myself, oh my gosh, what can I tell them? What can I talk about? Uh, we at ECHO, we have a, a strong belief um, we want to respect our people. We are humble people, and, and that fits very well into our industry. We are simple. I did write a book called Simply Management, so that means I try my simple approach because if I would try to over-engineer my presentation, I'm sure that all the professors here in the room would tell me that I'm wrong and that they know better anyhow. Uh, and because I've been a teacher, I know how that feels. Now I have to make that thing work, and it does. So um, I want to talk with you a little bit about an idea about ECHO's approach and our real operational work on how to help our customers, farmers, uh, feeding the world. And it all starts with our vision. So when I came to ECHO in two, well, it's important to know the average uh, lifetime of a Fortune 500 CEO is two and a half years. I do that from 2004 on, so I somewhat survived. Uh, and when I came to America, I was actually thinking about uh, what uh, could the strategy for ECHO be. And uh, our strategy already, or our vision we defined at that time, high-tech solutions for farmers feeding the world. So this is a brand new vision because the initial vision was high-tech solutions for professional farmers feeding the world. And then we figured out that there is a very, very important segment in our industry of smallholders which are relevant to the societies, to the countries they are living in and they're working in, but nobody is really helping them. In Africa, uh, there is, uh, uh, my favorite uh, saying in Africa is, no farmers, no nation. And farmers in Africa, but not only in Africa, in many other countries of the world, are small. And so, therefore, we decided to take the professional out because we, in the meantime, also manufacture and develop solutions for subsistent farmers. Why? Because we want them to make money and then they get out of the subsistency. I will talk about that later. We think that the productivity of all farmers need to increase, which is, of course, for us, a great idea because we live from the idea that continents like Africa or countries like Russia or China have to be mechanized. We also think that we are just starting to see super intelligent high-tech solutions in the area of precision farming. While in the in the past, basically, a farmer, uh, farming was almost like a craft. So a farmer here in Iowa, he maybe started planting not because of any kind of plan or any kind of uh, research he had done or analysis. M most of the time, he talked to his wife, and the wife said, well, actually, our neighbor starts planting, and then the whole village did it. Maybe that was the wrong moment in time. So this is completely changing. And like we all know in manufacturing, it starts with measuring your results. So we know from factories that you basically measure what you are doing all over your processes. And when you know all those measurements and when you know the final result, then you start to optimize the process. That's called Six Sigma or Kaizen or Continuous Improvement Process or whatsoever. We do believe that this also is starting to happen in farming. And it all starts with yield mapping. 
So our products today are in a position to exactly know what the results of the harvest are by square inch or square centimeter, wherever you are. And uh, then you basically re-engineer the whole process. And you do that when you don't work, because in winter time you have plenty of time to think about it. And you can also ask advisors. You can talk to your seed supplier. You can talk to a consultant. You can talk to your tractor uh, manufacturer. And then you start to re-plan, and then you basically come up with a plan on how to improve your farm uh, uh, productivity in the next cycle. Therefore, when we had a discussion about the purpose of ECHO, we decided that our purpose is improving farm productivity. We are the only pure play in our industry. So we do and think nothing else than agriculture. We don't make lawn mowers. We don't make golf equipment and turf equipment. Uh, we are not into wind energy. We do everything a farmer needs. And farmer needs more than just farm equipment, we figured out. In many countries of the world, the post-harvest losses, so the grain which is lost after the harvest due to bad storage conditions, is 50% and more. I've been on a big farm in Russia in December, and I was very proud to see that one of our combine harvesters was threshing corn at minus 20 Celsius. And it worked. And it harvested deep frozen corn, which was stored at the side of the field. You can't imagine how big the operation is. You basically see the harvester leaving and then one hour later is not back yet. So that means we really talk about huge farm operations here. And you can imagine how big it was a mountain of deep frozen corn. So what do the farmers do? They basically come with a wheel loader, bring it into the stable where it's basically then first melting and then fed to the animals. Actually, not a bad process as, as such. The only problem is this pile of corn is the, big, the biggest uh, self-service uh, supermarket for the complete wildlife of uh, east of Moscow, <laughs> including also all the retired people and the not-so-wealthy people who go there with a bucket in order to get something to eat for themselves and also for their animals. So we decided to look into this, and we made an acquisition, and we bought the market leader in corn logistics, or let's say grain logistics. We manufacture grain storage, silos, grain drying equipment, grain transportation equipment. And uh, the great thing is, this is something which is very, very easy to sell as long as the farmer finds a bank to help him to finance it, because the return on invest on a grain elevator from GSI is less than a year through the, uh, uh, through the reduction of grain losses. So out of a sudden, from losing 50%, you lose almost nothing anymore. Another very important thing is I think we can easily agree on the fact that all of us, wherever we are in society and wherever we live, in what, what country we are, wherever we live, we, I think, all agree that all people in the world have the right to be, to get quality food. I think all people have the right to get education, a house, and some kind of security and peace. If we agreed on that, then we could start on thinking, what can our contribution be? 
And here in quality food, it's very simple to organize, or rather simple to organize that in everything which is grain. It's by far more complicated to do it for protein, for meat. Because what modern society wants and what we all want is we want to eat meat from happy animals, from animals who had a wealthy life. So we don't want to eat chicken where we know that that chicken really was in misery for weeks and we just saved it by making it a McNuggets or something like that. <laughs> so this is another business we are working on and it's really fun because out of a sudden with the know-how of the academic world and of manufacturing, we find solutions. So we have now chicken houses, which are almost like, uh, they're basically they have little condos in it, <laughs> where you can uh, drink and eat and lay your egg, and the chicken can choose where to go. And it's very funny to observe that. One is going to the same little condo all the time, the other one always wants to be together, together with somebody. They are made for one chicken mainly, but you can see three squeezed in one. And the other one wants to be in a different one every time. Uh, and then you figure out, oh, well, it's actually not as easy as you thought, because when it's a multi-storage multi building, so to say, made out of wire, the guys who live in the first floor suffer a little bit from... Uh, <laughs> what's happening on the fourth floor. So this could be fixed easily with people who are in manufacturing because there is a belt going below every stable or every row. They're like townhouses in a way, and it's basically transport, the, the continuous transportation of manure out of the way. Um, those ideas, now you can generate in-house, but I think Somebody, I think, has a presentation here or had already a presentation talking about that it's cool to be in our business. I strongly believe that it's super cool. And I, I think also one day the farmers of Nigeria want to be called farmers again and not agro, agropreneurs. agropreneurs. <laughs> um, and so not all ideas are generated uh, in a company, in a big public-owned company. So they're slow, they're bureaucratic. If you want to see what that means, just walk to your local egg, manuf egg equipment manufacturer. You can see how they, how they work. We are the same, pretty much. So we thought it might, it might make sense to look into startups. And we do that again in Berlin during the Green Week. We do something new now. We invite people from all over the world to come to us with great ideas for our customers. Great ideas for improvements in agriculture and farming. We don't know the results yet, but we, we saw, I saw the first, well, we have, I think, so far, uh, 8,500 applications. So that's all ideas, inventions, and even small companies. And it's amazing, I, I remember a guy, <laughs> because I found it kind of funny, a guy from Africa who has uh, founded a business. He bought an old tractor and an old tractor trailer. And he has loaded it with thousands, I think 2,000 or whatsoever, lead acid old car batteries. And he charges those batteries and then he goes on the road and his business is selling charge opportunities for owners of cell phones. And uh, the, the, the amazing thing is, um, and here developed countries might have a problem, we talked about infrastructure. The infrastructure for cell phones in Africa is I think better than in my home country of Germany. That is why I became American in 2010. <laughs> um, I want to shortly cover, because this is the theme of this event here, the, if I could, I want to cover 
what we are doing in Africa. You heard already that Africa is the most important opportunity for our industry. The African population is one of the youngest, one of course we need to, to say here for, let's say in Iowa, it's maybe worse to mention Africa is not a country. Uh, this is also something I, I told the president when I met him. Um, uh, and, he, and he pretended to know, and when I said how many countries are there on the continent, uh, he delegated the answer to my friend Sonny Perdue. Uh, <laughs> so Africa is a continent with plenty of cultures with hundreds of languages, even within one country, you might have people of different cultures and languages. And therefore, it has to be organized. But one important thing is, there's no con continent of the world which has a younger population than Africa. That's a big asset. We actually in Europe are more or less running a retirement home, similar to Florida. Uh, so Africa has very young, very dynamic, and highly intelligent and motivated people. And when you go there, you will be very surprised because even in modest circumstances, you meet extremely happy people at the same time. And they are happy because they see the future as something they want to work on. They want to achieve something, they want to do something. That's one asset, the people. The second asset, is the land. Africa is the only area in the world where we have land which is available with water and the right climate, and in some areas you can even harvest several times per year. And it's the only area in the world where farmland is available. And this is a huge opportunity for all of us, for everybody in our industry, but this will help Africa to develop, and it will help the world to have enough quality food in the future. So the problems we talk about, there's no industry in the world which basically has developed or generated similar productivity improvements like the farmer's debt. So when you compare what farmers do with what farmers did uh, 100 years ago, huge productivity improvements, most of you know the numbers, and those numbers you can see in any other business, whether it's steel or automotive or whatsoever. So what are we doing in Africa? One is we are very proud, we are the only player in the industry having a factory on the continent. We have people, we have created jobs in Africa, and we basically develop now a distribution. When you go to Africa, you need to do something which uh, you might not need to do, in, certainly not here in the corn belt, but uh, you might not need to do in many countries of the world. In Africa, it's not enough to just sell them a tractor or a combine or a plow. You need to explain from only a hand tool how mechanized modern farming works from the beginning to the end. And we have basically, one could call it almost a, I want, don't want to be arrogant here with all the important deans and presidents and professors, but we have almost like a kind of mini university which started in Zambia, we call it the Future Farm. It employs about 150 people in the meantime, of which 95% are local Africans. We just basically trained them according to what we know, the train, uh, train the trainer model. We brought them to the US, we brought them to Europe, and now they work as teachers, as almost uh, uh, they're very great teachers, and we do that together with churches because the churches have very, very engaged and very, very reliable people. You just need to tell them what they need to teach, and then they do it. Uh, and so here we train hundreds of young farmers every year, and we do that before we sell them a tractor. 
What we then also found out, the problem of the subsistent farmer is basically that he does not make money. He does produce just enough to survive. And with bad weather, when the harvest is done or gone, he is really running into an existential problem. So what we need to manage is that also the subsistent farmer generates what we call cash flow, so that he produces more than the family needs and can sell some of his product. And then the money he makes can be used either for bad times or for sending kids to school or for investing in the farm. How have we done that in our world in the past? We also had very, very small farms. When the settlers came here, they didn't have big farms from the beginning. So we did have co-ops. We had villages owning a tractor. And we still have that in some parts of the world. So we go to Africa with agronomists from Brazil, because those are the people who know how to develop uh, uh, almost deserts, it's not a desert, it's a, but it's closed into farmland. And we go with co-op people from Europe who train on and explain farmers what it means to have a machine ring or to, have, to own a tractor with five farmers. And so this is not changing the world from one day to the other. It's modest and humble, but it works. And we think that farming has a brilliant future. When I moved into that business, all the headhunters and all the experts and other managers said, oh my gosh, what did you do, my son? Because farming was seen as the most old-fashioned industry you could be in. You all know that this has completely changed, and I'm very, very sure that we are all together, that we will be in a position to feed that growing world population. Thank you very much. And here are also the things I can't uh, explain how to do it, <laughs> but <laughs> some people do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Martin Rieschenhagen, that's uh, thank you. What a great way to start.